talk here in a second. Usually we have uh, sort of science in the news, and there was, this past week, there's been a couple of science items in my area, in Antarctica. How many people heard about them penetrating to the bottom of the Antarctic ice sheet and getting samples of water? Just happened yesterday. So they, they, it's at the Wizard, uh, the Willens ice stream, and they drilled, uh, it's about a half a kilometer to the base, and uh, got water samples, and they're looking for evidence of life in those water samples. So that was, that was a huge success. Uh, I thought they abandoned that. That was the British. The British. The British didn't get in. It was. A, it was a, the Cold War, as you will. So they, <laughs> <laughs> there was the British. The uh, the Russians are also trying this year, and the the U.S. and the U.S. was the first in this year. So we win. All right. Yeah. All right. So, so is that a step towards global warming, or is that does that mean something to do with that? No, that's just, it's just uh, life life in extreme environments. But yeah, <laughs> or the Cold War. Um, so the Russians are still going to go into Lake Vostok uh, this later this summer sometime. So that's happening. Uh, what else? Any any other items? See science in the news. The uh, monkey in space. The Ira Iranians uh, sent a monkey into space. Apparently, is that real? Yes. I mean, I, I read that too, but it seemed kind of uh, maybe. All right. 70 miles up. Okay, apparently they sent a monkey into space. Um, talking about monkeys, I was in Toronto last month. I saw the place where the IKEA monkey was. You know. <laughs> Any other science in the news? Okay. Well, we're gonna. I'm gonna introduce uh, tonight's speaker, and I, I feel a little embarrassed because I didn't print out his resume before I think I cut up here. But Joe has been to almost every uh, science pub we've given. And at one lecture, he uh, he asked a question, and in that in that question, he indicated that he had worked with Werner von Braun in the past, and he had a history of rocket science. So, between the organizers, we're all like, "What's his email? How do we communicate with him?" So we had, we finally got a hold of him and got him to agree to give a talk. And um, maybe when Joe starts, he can give a bit of his background and how he I'm sure it's part of this. Um, and he did email it to me, but I forgot to print it out before I came here. So Joe's going to talk about us, talk to us about uh, working for Werner von Braun and uh, launching of the first U.S. satellite. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I don't know where to stand. There's a lot of people back here, and I don't want to be in the way. So I'll just sit down while I talk. Okay. Uh, Spin this around so you can hit it from up here. I'll just sit down. Um, yeah, my name is Joe Mayer. Physicist, uh, I'm a lawyer. Don't, don't, don't worry, it's not bad. And all, of, all of my clients were homeless people, so I retired from the law firm about um, 14 years ago, in 1999, and went back into um, astrophysics, as a matter of fact. Um, how did I get to know Von Braun? Um, while I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. Uh, I was drafted along with four other graduate students, fellow graduate students, and one, uh, one chemistry graduate student. Uh, we appealed the decision to draft us out of graduate school, and we won. However, we had been sworn into the Army before the appeal was favorable for us. Uh, However, the Army at that time had a program called S&P, Scientific and Professional. If you had a degree in science, engineering, or some other useful uh, <laughs> um, dis discipline, uh, after basic training, and if you turned down the opportunity to go to officer's candidate school, uh, they would put you in one of the government facilities, uh, a laboratory. Uh, there were several around the country. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be assigned to uh, the Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, I arrived there on a uh, January, uh, March morning uh, on, a, on a steam engine pulled train from St. Louis. Great, great experience. I got off the train and I was confronted by two signs. One said white and one said colored. And that was a shock. <laughs> um, anyway, I, uh, I worked uh, uh, not immediately for Von Braun. I worked uh, 
for about three months in something called um, mechanical optical tracking uh, at White Sands, New Mexico. Uh, we were, they, the Army, was testing uh, short-range rockets called uh, uh, Little John and Honest John. And the way we did it was kind of funny. You had the launch pad, uh, uh, launch trailer, and uh, on about 500 yards, 500 meters down the field, there were two large towers. One had a uh, high-speed camera, it, two, two cameras, one at 1,500 frames per second, the other at 5,000 frames per, per second. On the nose of the rocket, there was a small two-inch first surface uh, a mirror. And on the other tower, there was a Latin square. A Latin square is a device where it's broken up into little segments, little squares. And no matter which way you go, you will never encounter the same uh, series of events. So we would uh, film this as the rocket was fired for the first 500 yards of its uh, uh, trajectory. And the mirror would reflect, of course, uh, the position it was going to uh, take on the, in, uh, in our cameras. And uh, we would film that, and we would send it to mathematicians who, using algorithms and a Marshall calculator, would uh, then determine the actual pitch and yaw of the uh, uh, things. But I, I must say this, uh, while he was down there in White Sands Proving Ground, it was at the same time that there was a, uh, a test that the Army was running. Some of you may remember the Nike defense missiles they had all over the country. Well, uh, they didn't work. <laughs> uh, I, I witnessed a, a, a filming of one of the events there. They had a B-17 bomber, World War II bomber, on autopilot, going around in a circle at about, just about stalled speed, a little faster than that. They fired 32 uh, Nike missiles at it, and the 32nd one hit it. And that's what we all saw on television. <laughs> Everyone was happy. Uh, but uh, most of my graduate work had been done in, uh, in spectroscopy, and uh, so Von Braun learned about this through some method or other, and he had me transferred directly to his unit. And uh, the rest of my talk and the rest of the pictures up here will describe that. and 80 of his colleagues were brought to the United States in 1947. Uh, the Army called it Operation Paperclip, and he immediately began a personal program of getting into space. He didn't want to do anything else but get into space. That was Werner when he first became uh, an officer in the German Army. Um, he, he, he received his Ph.D. in physics in the mid-30s, and with a promise from Hitler to work on rockets, he joined the Nazi party and became a member of the SS Waffen, one of the worst segments of the Nazi party. And he was sent to the northern city of Penamunda, which is very near the uh, Dutch border. Uh, it's where the, some German scientists had already been working on the so-called buzz bomb. It was a pulsed jet uh, bomb, not very good. The, the people in England at whom it was aimed knew very well that they were safe if they could hear it. When, it, when they couldn't hear the, the buzzing, they ran for cover because that's when the rocket, the jet, would start to fall. Uh, Hermann Obert, a very great uh, German physicist uh, whom I respect, uh, uh, reluctantly joined Hitler's efforts uh, to destroy the uh, finance capital, which was Hitler's main enemy. Uh, it wasn't so much London or anyone else. It was finance capital. It was a great battle between finance and manufacturing capital. Um, but Oberth worked with him at uh, Penamunde, reluctantly.
Lincoln. Uh, that's on the left is uh, Herman Ober. Um, von Braun was not completely isolated among the, uh, the slaves who did the work for all of them, the, the machinists, the people who kept records and so forth. And um, he sent this postcard to uh, a friend of his, Eva Brown, who was Hitler's mistress. So he, uh, he had some contact with the upper echelons of the uh, Nazi party. Um, he set to uh, work immediately using the designs of Robert Goddard. Dr. Robert Goddard was an American pioneer in uh, liquid fuel uh, rockets. There'll be more about him later. Uh, he, he built a scaled up model, which he called uh, the A1. It didn't work, uh, but he set forth and made modifications and worked for several years, from 1938 until about uh, 1943. This was the first V2. It was formerly called the A4. The V stands for vengeance. And uh, you can see from the uh, person standing there that uh, it's a pretty large object. Um, he told us one day that at Punaminde, Hitler, uh, Hitler showed up unannounced to see the marvelous new weapon that was being developed. And up to that point, all of von Braun's rockets had either blown up on the uh, launch stand or dropped into the sea headed in the wrong direction. So he, he knew he was in trouble when Hitler showed up. However, uh, they, they simulated a, an explosive load on the V-2, fired it, and it headed in the direction of England. Hitler wanted to destroy London, the world's finance capital, but not Manchester or Liverpool, the world's manufacturing centers at that time. Uh, von Braun told us uh, that Hitler was overjoyed and ordered full speed ahead on the project. Uh, the first successful launch of a fully armed V-2 occurred on October 3rd, uh, 1943. They built and fired over 3,000 of these things. Uh, they were very accurate because von Braun had taken great care. Uh, they were primarily aimed at London, but when the Allies began making progress toward Germany, the ground troops, they also aimed them at uh, Antwerp, Belgium, and at, the, uh, at Denmark. Um, Germany was losing the war, and the Russians were advancing rapidly at the Eastern Front through Poland. Von Braun and 80 of his closest associates commandeered a passenger train and took it down into Austria, where the U.S. had established a, uh, an advance base. Uh, they all surrendered unconditionally, but insisted that General Eisenhower, who was the, uh, in charge of the Allied forces in Europe at that time, uh, that he be advised who they were. Well, von Braun knew very well, or Eisenhower knew very well who they were. Uh, the rocket scientists were evacuated from Mexico temporarily, pending a decision by President Harry Truman. Now, the United States knew about, through their spies, knew about the rocket projects, and they were very anxious to have some of their own. So that's why they uh, made concessions to uh, von Braun and his group. The operation was called Operation Paperclip, and uh, von Braun, and that fellow standing just to his left is Ernst Stuhlinger, a very, very talented mathematician. Uh, he, he was also in Huntsville. Uh, now, in World War II, uh, I think it was in 1943, the U.S. Congress uh, passed a bill, and it was signed, uh, excluding any member of the Nazi party, especially those in the SS Waffen, from entering the United States. The book is still, the law is still on the books, and you may recall recently in the last two or three years, some fellow named Demyanyuk from the Chicago area uh, was deported after it was shown in court that he was a member of the SS Waffen. Uh, so the army, instead of bringing von Braun and his group into uh, the United States, which they legally couldn't, they sent him to Mexico City for 18 months. Uh, then they sent uh, von Braun and his team to Ciudad Juarez in Mexico, where they entered the United States at El Paso in Texas as Mexican national immigrants. <laughs> In 1950, the Mexican immigrants were moved to Redstone Arsenal in northern Illinois, adjacent to Huntsville, and began work on medium-range artillery missiles. Now, 
The United States had commissioned Von Braun and his team to develop uh, rockets that would run uh, oh, between uh, 200 and 700 miles. Uh, Von Braun was not happy with that idea. Uh, this is a person, uh, an identity badge for uh, some of the people who worked at uh, the Redstone Arsenal. It used to be a place where they made and stored ammunition for the Army, Navy, and uh, Air Force. Um, it's on a huge site, 17,000 acres on the Tennessee River. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it was placed there for, uh, during the, uh, World War II because it was far enough from the Gulf of Mexico so that uh, German uh, submarines could not fire on it, and they couldn't come up the Mississippi River either, as a matter of fact, or the Tennessee River, to destroy it. So they were very happy with that. Um, Von Braun built a small one meter long satellite designed for low Earth orbit. The Army didn't know anything about this because he had carte blanche to do anything he wanted. Uh, in 1950, the Army also formed the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, ABMA, and Von Braun was to develop this medium range missile and to go two to 700 miles. He designed it to go 2,000 miles because he wanted to go into space. Uh, where did Von Braun get his ideas. Uh, it turns out that uh, this fellow, Robert Goddard, who was experimenting with liquid fuel rockets as early as 1913 near Boston, uh, was his inspiration. Uh, that's uh, Robert Goddard with a small, little liquid fuel rocket on a primitive launch stand. Uh, Goddard spent 24 years until 1937 designing and launching his rockets from an isolated ocean shore until citizens fearful of the noise and the probability that a rocket would crash demanded local government ban Goddard from his experiments. They did. Uh, he resumed his experiment on Lowly Beach in Maryland uh, and then later from White Sands Proving Grounds in New Mexico. Uh, <laughs> that's one of the early pictures of, of, of Goddard in his uh, launch pad, mobile launch pad, if you will. From time to time, he received public notice in the local newspapers, and on, the, uh, on three occasions, his efforts were recorded in the New York Times, including one correction in 1920. I get a kick out of this. This is a correction. Can I read it? On January 13, 1920, Topics of the Times, an editorial page feature of the New York Times, dismissed the notion that a rocket could function in a vacuum and commented on the ideas of Robert Goddard, the rocket pioneer, as follows. That Professor Goddard, with his chair at Clark College and his countenancing of his, uh, uh, the Smithsonian Institution, does not know the relation of action to reaction and of the need to have something better than a vacuum against which to react. To say that would be absurd, of course. He only seems to lack the knowledge ladled out in daily in schools. Uh, that was the editorial. Uh, further investigation, uh, the correction says, uh, and experimentation confirmed the fi findings of I Isaac Newton in the 17th century. <laughs> and it is now definitely established that a rocket can function in a vacuum as well as in an atmosphere. The Times regrets the error. <laughs> Goddard filed patents on his liquid fuel pumps and the control mechanisms for his rocket. He provided regular reports to the U.S. Army and his progress on new ideas he developed. This is one of the patent drawings that he had. It's almost illegible. It showed a great deal of, uh, I saw the original, the, the pumping mechanisms and the timing devices were really elaborate. Von Braun told us, he confessed to this, that after he was appointed to lead Hitler's rocket program in 38, he wrote to the U.S. printing office in Washington and for 85 cents obtained copies of all of Goddard's designs, patents, experiments, and reports. Uh, he said his first rocket, called the A-1, was an exact scaled-up version of Goddard's 1937 design. Sort of the WikiLeaks of the 1930s. Uh, it didn't work. Rocket science, or rather, really, rocket engineering became the pursuit of many nations. The mechanisms of a rocket were much different than the 
Fourth of July fireworks we see at Navy Pier. Very elaborate. Uh, Goddard's ideas caught on in other nations. The old giant rockets others were experimenting with, with were not very large compared to those of the 80s and 90s. Uh, this is a quotation from Goddard. I, I love it. It is difficult to say what is impossible, or the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And that's very true. And Goddard also found time to write several best-selling science fiction novels. And his dreams of yesterday became one of the best-sellers in science fiction. Uh, Jules Verne inspired many people also with his science fiction story. And von Braun avidly read the German translations of his space stories. Goddard taught physics at Clark College in Maryland, and he was already thinking of going to the moon. And uh, this is a picture of him in his classroom. But notice the trajectory of the rocket. It's a straight line from the Earth to the moon. <laughs> not, not a great idea. Von Braun had a better idea. He used uh, the gravitational effect uh, of the Earth in orbit and uh, was going to the moon that way. He worked out the celestial mechanics for doing it, one of the first to do so. Um, now, in 1950, Von Braun built this little thing on the right there. It was designed for low Earth orbit, but he couldn't launch it. He wasn't given permission to launch it. Um, he had virtually unlimited funds to pursue his dreams. He satisfied the military's ambition of developing reliable, reliable tactical military rockets. At Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, U.S. scientists and engineers developed shorter range missiles based on Von Braun's design and then tested them at White Sands in New Mexico. Uh, Von Braun, uh, explaining his uh, passion, uh, why he, not the U.S., he must go to space. He tried under Hitler, but he had no reliable reports of orbiting V-2s. Although, he said that there were several that were launched, he could not account for them. They, they were never sighted again. So who knows what happened to that. Uh, that's uh, one of the V-2 rockets that he, he developed. Uh, at Redstone Arsenal, it was a military installation, and the uh, commander of the Redstone Arsenal called it the civil servant. It was all the guts had been removed from it. And he said, uh, they call it the civil servant because it wouldn't work and you couldn't fire it. <laughs> In uh, 1953, uh, Von Braun took his little satellite uh, to Washington to ask permission from the Secretary of Defense, Charles Wilson, to launch it into orbit. Uh, Wilson was the Secretary, Defense Secretary during the first term of the Eisenhower administration. Wilson was on leave from his job as CEO of General Motors. Uh, Wilson served uh, fairly well. Uh, that's a picture of Wilson. He'll live in infamy. Permission was denied, of course. And surprisingly, Wilson told Von Braun why he denied permission. Uh, Von Braun said that Wilson said, if Von Braun could launch a satellite into orbit, he could put a nuclear bomb anywhere on the Earth. But Wilson said that the Chrysler Corporation held the contract for missile bodies, while General Motors had the contract for bomber airframes. With precision missiles, there would be no need for bombs. Uh, in his Senate confirmation hearings, by the way, Wilson said, what's good for General Motors is good for the USA. Uh, in 57, 58, uh, it was uh, designated the International Geophysical Year. All nations participated in experiments at all, in all disciplines to learn more about Earth. The United States announced that it would put a basketball-sized satellite into orbit around the Earth to determine density and irregularity in the spheroid surface of the Earth. The U.S. Navy was selected to design, develop, and launch the missile, now called Project Vanguard. All of Vanguard's rockets blew up on the launch dam, and even after the size of the uh, satellite was reduced to the size of a hard baseball, it, 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 it didn't work. Uh, meanwhile, for the 40th anniversary of the Russian Revolution in October 57, Russia launched a 1,500-pound satellite called Sputnik into Earth orbit. 
uh, Russia's success was partially due to the German scientist and engineer that von Braun left behind at Penamunda when they were captured by the Russians. Uh, so von Braun took his little one meter satellite designed in 1950 and returned to Washington after the Sputnik success. New Secretary of Defense, Neil McElroy, permission granted and please hurry. <laughs> von Braun already had the event planned. He knew he would get permission. Uh, he was fitted onto the nose of a modified Redstone missile. That was the missile that was supposed to go only two to 700 miles that he designed to go 2,000. And on January 31st, 58, it went into a low Earth orbit on the first try. Much was made of the missile gap and the lack of engineers and physical scientists in the U.S. because of the Russian success. Uh, personal note, one of my fellow graduate students who had studied computers, the old seven, IBM 7070, whatever they were, uh, was in charge of the successful launch. Uh, the Army and Redstone Arsenal responded to the miss missile gap by recruiting almost every high school science teacher in the southern states to work in the missile programs at Redstone Arsenal, at the Proving Grounds in Maryland, and at White Sands Proving Grounds in New Mexico. The obvious result was not bigger, faster rocket development, but a lack of competent science education in Southern High School for the next 10 years. Uh, if rocket science is as difficult as it's cracked up to be compared with such lowly pursuits as scientific education of the young and the general public, and we need to dig more deeply into the reasons why rocket science recorded such dazzling achievements in a relatively short time of the 20th century, whereas the problem of popularizing the aims, methods, and finding of genuine science remains a very challenging, vexing one even today. Von Braun's reputation was made, and the space race was on. The U.S. leadership was implied, if not realized. Uh, he now felt confident to propose his real aims, space travel to moon, Mars, and beyond. Um, and he was ready for it. Um, he had secretly built eight full-scale models of space vehicles. Didn't look anything like the space shuttle, but they were workable. But he realized that bringing a vehicle back from space would result in very high temperatures as the ship experienced friction from the atmosphere at high entry speeds, uh, 17 to 18,000 miles an hour. He needed a coating for his metal spaceships to prevent them from burning up on re-entry. This is where I made a very small contribution to the space program. We built a 12-foot long steel vessel that we called the, uh, uh, the artificial lung that people uh, used to use for uh, um, to help uh, victims of uh, Polio, thank you. Uh, we would draw a vacuum and it fitted it with a spectroscope to determine the temperature of a very hot plasma. And the argon gas plasma generator had gas pass passing through a 6,000 volt, 600 amp gap and produced temperatures between 14 and 28,000 degrees Kelvin. Uh, very good. We tried everything. Uh, every sort of material was placed in the plasma to record what happened. Everything immediately evaporated. All molecular bonds disappeared at about 11,000 degrees Kelvin. Apparently no material would serve as a coating for von Braun's spaceships. My colleague, Dave, ha Dave Haugate, jokingly said, we might as well try a house brick. So we did. The house brick slowly abated, ablated, but did not evaporate immediately. And that made the uh, everyone think in terms of the ceramic tiles on the space shuttles. Uh, von Braun achieved fame and distinction around the world. In Huntsville, elementary school was named for him. There's an astronomical observatory that now bears his name. And he responded to this acclaim by growing a beard. I why he did that. Uh, he decided to get married. And uh, instead of uh, finding a local uh, bride, uh, he returned to Germany and uh, uh, married a, 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 another member of the former German uh, royalty. They had two daughters, 
who spoke English without a German accent or a southern drawl, as a matter of fact. Uh, he was, I never saw Van Brown without a cigarette. He developed an aggressive lung cancer and died at age 65. Uh, it's his tombstone. I have no idea what Psalms 19.1 is. I'm sure it's significant. So, the moral is the journey to the grave is not with the intention of arriving safely with a pretty, well-preserved body, but rather to slide in broadside, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and proclaiming loudly, wow, what a ride. <laughs> So if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Jim. Where did you fit in with Found Brown, and can you elaborate a little bit about how on uh, your work with him? Uh, we had a small group of about nine people, Von Brown at the head, and uh, I fitted in because of my spectroscopic skills, and uh, uh, he deemed that essential. How was he as a manager or a leader? Oh, very good question. He demanded obedience. <laughs> he was an arrogant SOB, <laughs> uh, but brilliant, really brilliant. Uh, and uh, he managed things, not micromanage, mind you, but he told people what to do, and they did it. And if they didn't do it, we never saw them again. <laughs> In the back. Did, uh, did the Russians get the better scientists? I understand Philby was feeding the list to the American, uh, the Allied, Western Allied intelligence guys. Yes, the, the uh, Russians did get some of the better scientists. But Brown had picked his, his team from friends and uh, people who kissed his butt, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the Russians got not only the, 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 the scientists and the engineers, uh, but they got all of the equipment that had been used to develop the rockets and the buzz bombs. So they were very happy with that. And the Russians were no slouches themselves. They had a very talented group of uh, engineers and scientists there as well. Now, however, uh, the reason that they used, the reason that they launched a 1,500-pound uh, satellite was not because it was to show up the United States, but rather the Russians used a fuel called boron hydride, which burns in spurts, like this. And they had to over-design the uh, compound so it would take that tremendous acceleration. Anybody else? How would, do you think you would compare U.S. scientists today versus the rest of the world? I'm very favorably inclined being a U.S. scientist, <laughs> uh, uh, I think we have a very good uh, uh, group of people here, and we have a, an influx of uh, m many talented people from abroad, from the uh, Eurasia, from Europe, Africa, and so forth. So uh, they become integrated into our way of doing things. Uh, a fellow told me recently, uh, good old uh, Craig Hogan from Fermilab, uh, he said that the graduate schools in the United States are better than any graduate schools or education anywhere else in the world, including Japan. When you started working with him, did you know who and what his background was? Who he was? You, there had been uh, comments in the, in the uh, news media, and, uh, and he had been captured by uh, <laughs> the United States and... Uh, but that was after he became a Mexican immigrant and uh, moved into Huntsville. <laughs> Where did the story develop that he loaded up trucks with rocket fuel and headed west to surrender? No, it, he, he took a, uh, a, a train. No, I have no idea. He never mentioned that. He, he, was, he was personal. Uh, we used to have bull sessions and he would uh, sort of let loose a little bit, loosen the tie and, and uh, talk to us like humans. <laughs> How long were you in his employ for? Uh, from 1956 to 1962. Uh, Huntsville, Alabama, 
is the watercress capital of the world. Uh, there wasn't much going on down. When I went down there in 1956, uh, the, the population was 15,000 people. And when I left in 62, it was 65,000. Almost all of that addition was Yankees, Yankee scientists, engineers, and technicians. It completely changed the, the character of the town. So it was very interesting to observe and live there during that time. As a follow-up, was there one favorite moment that you can recall in working for him that comes to mind? When uh, the news broke that uh, Russia had, not, had launched the, uh, the Sputnik and it was in orbit, there was dread everywhere in, in Huntsville, but not Don Brown. Uh, he knew, he said, this is my chance, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get there. And he did. Was the Saturn rocket basically his idea, or was that a lot of people? That was basically his idea, but it developed, um, um, went through, through many iterations before it became the Saturn V rocket. Uh, uh, an interesting side note, down in Huntsville, uh, we used to entertain uh, members of Congress and the influential public. Um, we had a test stand, horizontal test stand, where we tested rocket motors. And about a half a mile away, we had bleachers. And uh, we, the, the senators, congressmen, and others would gather, sitting in the bleachers, and we'd set off the rocket motors. Horrible noise. You could hear it 20 miles away. And uh, smoke, in, incredible. <laughs> of course, the rocket didn't go anywhere, the rocket motor, because it was bunkered into concrete. So it didn't go, but it made a very impressive sight and sound. And <laughs> generated more funding. <laughs> <laughs> How did he break his arm? I saw that uh, he had his arm in a slick uh, and a cast and a, a broomstick. Uh, when he first, first captured by the Americans, how did he, how did he fracture his, his arm? You know? He fell. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our laboratory was on a hill in, uh, in Huntsville, in uh, Redstone Arsenal, called Squirrel Hill. And it was called Squirrel Hill because there were a lot of squirrels there who used to store nuts in the ground. It was a forested area. And uh, he came into the uh, office section of the laboratory one time. And uh, as he was heading in, he tripped on a nut. <laughs> broke his arm. <laughs> More questions? The 50s and the 60s were a different time politically. With the use of slave labor, to produce these things in Germany, you know, the war crime issue. You know, you know, people like yourself are going down there working with these people, and you have some knowledge of what really went on back there. Was it just because we were going against the Russians that we wanted to use whatever we could without really judging what had gone on? That is an excellent question, and it, it, it troubled many of the Yankees in, in the group, in the people in Huntsville. Uh, I still haven't resolved that question. We didn't know the details of uh, um, the slave labor at the uh, Penamunda. We knew about the Holocaust and the Auschwitz and so forth. Uh, we did not know that uh, Von Braun and his group were members of the SS Waffen, which was the, the group that was mostly responsible for the atrocities at the Auschwitz and other camps. Did Von Braun cook the books so he had enough money to build the secret rockets, or how did he get the funding for that? He, he just asked for it and they gave it to him. He didn't have to cook any books. He just said, I need another 150,000 or a million two or whatever. And they gave it to him. Because he was, he was the only hope they had for developing uh, medium range uh, artillery missiles. The U.S. had no experience with this whatsoever. And he trained a lot of uh, American engineers uh, in the development of these things. So where did he build his secret rockets? Uh, on, in Huntsville, uh, there's lots of bunkers from the old ammunition storage area, but there's also some huge Quonset huts, and that's where he built them. And uh, he 
he, he used uh, machinists who were trained in the South, uh, in uh, Birmingham and uh, from Atlanta, uh, brought them in and they built these uh, full-scale model, eight full-scale model sh uh, spaceships for them. And everybody just figured they were part of the artillery project. No, they, 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 nobody asked. <laughs> You're doing a great job. Just keep going. <laughs> yes? Yeah, Huntsville is one of the places where they have the space camp. I've been down there a few times, and I've often thought of sending my grandkids down there, but I don't necessarily want to go in that direction in life. But I'm just wondering whether or not you have any idea of how that space camp, if it's actually contributing. I mean, it's a private organization. You're familiar with it. If it's actually contributing to our efforts to be competitive and generating some benefits from, it. I mean, it might, I could probably go online and ask the same question. No, you're, you're, it's a good question. Uh, actually, the, the camp itself it appeals to more affluent people okay. whose children want to become astronauts, at least in their mind. And the, the age range <laughs> runs from six years of age up to 13. After 13, the, the kids have already made up their mind. It's not how to get to be an astronaut. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have my son. I have a friend that's in, into using rockets locally here. I don't want to tell you where he's at, or you probably want to move. But he's 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 into uh, racing lawnmowers. He's got a GE rocket engine on one. Supposedly it's the fastest one around, but it's got a t tail about 50 feet long when he ignites that. And he actually have, in the long run thing, you got to be on it too. So I often told him you got to be remote control for that thing. But <laughs> it's it's within Moon Township anyway. It's a science. You know. When you see it, when you see something blow up over there, you know what happened. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> Any more questions, Timothy? Again. When do you think we'll get to Mars? Why? No, when? Oh, when? Um, probably in three years. Humans will be there in three years. Carl Sagan, who was a classmate of mine, by the way, uh, showed uh, way back in the uh, 50s that uh, you can use an ion rocket. In fact, his famous uh, story or quotation is that if you could get an ion rocket into orbit around the Earth, uh, you could go to Mars at 8 o'clock in the morning, turn the rocket around and decelerate for the last half of the trip and um, do the same when you got to Mars and be back in time for lunch. Uh, and that, that's true. You know, if you make, go through the physical calculations, you can see that it can be done. How about the we, speed of light? That would be faster than the speed of light. No. no not, not quite. <laughs> It's what, about a 24 minute difference between Mars and Earth with light speed or something like that? Uh, it depends on its position and the, whether it's near uh, perihelion, aphelion, or how close to the Earth it is. It, it, it's close as it's about 35 million miles. And that was his uh, criteria for making that statement. Questions? Have you ever seen the movie October Sky? No, I haven't. Werner Ron Braun in it. He's part of the whole scene. Really? Yeah. No. It's based on the book The Rocket Boys. Yeah. I'll have to it's, a, it's a true story about, um, yeah. I can't remember the guy's name, uh, but he became a, a shuttle engineer and, and he wanted to be a rocket scientist and, and he eventually met Werner Ron Braun and got a job with NASA and shook his hand and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. it's a good sky. Yeah. It's a good yeah. It's a good yeah. Yeah. I've seen it, it's good. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, if anyone else in the audience wants to volunteer to give a talk in the future, you want to email me, and uh, we'll get you set up. Joe is one of our regular contributors, and that was a great talk. Thanks very much. Um, but I also ask, so you can stay as long as you want. Uh, one of the luxuries at the other places we don't have here is setup. So if I could have some volunteers to help me break down the chairs and put them in the back room, you know, not right away, but uh, it would be nice. All right, thanks for coming out, and I think it stopped raining, so thank you.